come back to the bearded historian. Last we had left off, a horde of zombies was set on its path towards Alexandria, and all that stood between certain death and Egypt's capital was an 18,000 strong fighting force of the Empire's Egyptian legions and their auxiliary units. Today's episode will not only explore the outcome of this encounter, but also look at the wider consequences and conclude our three-part mini-series on alternative history. So let's get right to it. The Empire's legions were undoubtedly one of the best trained and most disciplined fighting forces of their time. Heavily armored and armed, they were equipped to overwhelm their enemies in pitched battles wherever Rome needed to display its might. Moving away from a culture of individual warrior prowess, Rome's true power lay in the successful combination of technology, rigid discipline, training and warfare. Enemies were overwhelmed by a cohesive fighting force rather than a band of individual warriors, no matter how skillful they may be. Following that principle, the legions had been able to protect and expand the empire time and time again. They were Rome's first and last line of defense and had served her well for hundreds of years. Merca was proud to be part of this long-standing tradition even if he only served in an auxiliary cohort accompanying the highly praised legions. Today, they were facing a threat diametrically opposite to themselves and everything Rome's armies had ever faced before. The zombies fought in an unorganized blob of flesh and teeth. The danger lay in their inability to fear or even perceive the threat they were getting themselves into by rushing the Roman lines. And of course, as we have shown in our last episode, they outnumbered the Romans on a massive scale. While the legions arrived prepared for battle, the zombies simply arrived. They had no notion of what was about to happen and simply marched towards the opposing battle line, disregarding any battle convention or common strategy. But before they even reached Rome's neatly arranged battle formation, a bombardment of technological superiority was unleashed on them. Artillery fire, accompanied by a barrage of slingshots and arrows, was raining down on the uncontrolled horde from all sides. And while scores were hit and went down, the Roman commanders, for the first time ever, had to painfully acknowledge the fact that their usual battle strategies may not be enough to defeat this enemy. Flesh wounds didn't stop them, and neither did crushed or even severed limbs. Only the occasional lucky hit to the head seemed to do the job. Meanwhile, the wave of zombies just kept on coming, slowly increasing their crawling pace as they picked up the scent of fresh meat. At a close range, the first cohorts of legionaries released their usually deadly javelins, only to find that their impact was also severely limited, even impaled. The zombies did not seem to be less inclined to continue their rush forward and soon a full-blown melee engagement erupted all across the Roman lines. And in the middle of all of this, Merca was facing the husk of his brother. He and his comrades were trained, primed and equipped to kill as well as the legionaries beside them. But the assumption had always been that they would face human opponents. Slashing limbs, stabbing guts, and shoving their shields did very little to this enemy. Across the front line, Rome's soldiers had to either adapt very quickly or perish under the wave of corpses pushing against their shield wall. And while there undoubtedly would be some successes, ultimately the Roman approach to battle would prove futile against this new inhuman enemy. Their lines would begin to collapse under the pressure while the sheer number of zombies would slowly begin to envelop the whole force. Every killed zombie would swiftly be replaced by a seemingly endless supply of bodies, while every killed Roman actually helped replenishing the enemy's ranks. The risk of infection was extremely high in close quarter combat and soon the legionaries would face their former comrades as well. As the signal for retreat was given, the battle had long been lost and Rome's military behemoth 
had been crushed by an unlikely enemy no one was prepared for to fight. Being one of the lucky ones, Merkel had somehow managed to escape the slaughter alive and now found himself on the run, but there was almost nowhere left to run to now. All over the empire, the disastrous events of Egypt repeated themselves and while some localized engagements may have been won, Rome's resources were dwindling while the enemy's ranks grew with every passing hour. Every new attempt at making battle only saw this disparity grow bigger and bigger and soon the virus had spread all over the empire. The emperor and his council had to realize that pitched battles were no longer an option to contain this threat, if they had ever been an option to begin with. What remained of Rome's troops fortified up in city garrisons, local outposts and larger military camps. They could no longer hope to take the initiative and were left instead to defend whatever little pieces of uninfected territory they were left with. And so the zombies freely roamed the lands, bringing death to anyone or anything that hadn't retreated to protect its safe haven yet. However, at the time, society at large was still quite familiar with the concept of self-sustenance and localized farming, much more than we would be nowadays anyway. And so a number of these safe havens would actually successfully hold out and even grow during this time, while others would obviously succumb under the pressure and constant threat of infection. Chance played a big part here. Merker and a few of his fellow soldiers had managed to safely guide a group of civilians to a small island in the Nile and started settling in for the long haul, all the while observing the carnage happening all around them beyond the safety of the Nile waters. The empire had fallen. The emperor was dead. Many of its formerly glorious metropolitan centers had vanished into oblivion. After having unsuccessfully tried to shut itself off to the outer world, Rome, the heart of the empire itself, was in fact among the first to succumb to the virus. As months and years passed, a number of the urban centers and other fortified locations survived against all odds and emerged as shining pillars of humanity in an otherwise desolate world. Fear of the virus, a lack of understanding and a strong sense of self-preservation would soon result in general distrust and animosity towards strangers, leading to an ever-increasing isolation of the small surviving communities. With that isolation also came a decline in knowledge as all efforts were focused on the immediate survival rather than the betterment of society as a whole and philosophical exchange with others. Communities had to adapt to the circumstances and quite naturally a protective spirit would prevail over all other endeavors. Where previously the wise man had ruled, now the era of the strong man began. Quite similar to what the Völkerwanderung or the Big Migration caused in our timeline, in this alternative history a tribal hierarchy would soon replace the now redundant governments of the fallen empires. The surviving communities would follow the leadership of chiefs who projected an aura of power and seemed most likely to protect them against the hostile environment they were living in. A new dark age was looming and humankind's knowledge and power were in decline. But they had survived. And as time moved on, they would learn to adapt and emerge from the shadows as new civilizations. Eventually, some groups would start venturing out and some land would be reclaimed, taking the first small steps towards an era of the resurgence of man. Albeit slow, some progress would be made again as humankind was adapting to the post-apocalyptic world surrounding them and learned to live with the constant threat of the walking dead. But looking at that is kind of taking us beyond the scope of this episode. Maybe something to spend some time thinking on in the future. Who knows? But this is where we're at. Mankind had survived and they were entering the Middle Ages under circumstances quite unlike 
what our ancestors would have seen. And this is where we leave Mirka and Mahu behind and close our chapter on looking at a scenario in the world of alternative history. I hope you enjoyed the little series and as always invite you to share your comments and feedback below.